Friends, it is a joy to come together after a challenging week. I don't know about you, but as I watch the news and I think about uh, the nation of Ukraine, it sits heavy on my heart uh, for a lot of different reasons. Uh, Ukraine is a country uh, in Europe that probably has the fastest growing Christian population over the last 20 or 25 years. Uh, They're the largest missionary sending nation in Europe at this time, and we have brothers and sisters over there uh, who are right now in the crosshairs of suffering. And so when you think about the heaviness of that, it is so good to come together and to remind ourselves of the truths of God and to sing them, to sing these uplifting songs like the one we just sang, uh, and continue to place our focus directly on the one who is in control. I wanna ask you to turn your attention with me to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and grab a Bible and open there with me. And as you turn, perhaps you know the story of the British ocean liner, the RMS Lusitania, which was struck by a torpedo from a German submarine on May 7th, 1915. And it it appears that in an effort to minimize the panic, The captain of the vessel, William Thomas Turner, created a false sense of assurance for the people aboard. Shortly after the torpedo struck the liner, a fellow passenger, Charles Laureate, heard a female passenger call out, Captain, what do you wish us to do? And as one author remarks, the captain replied, Stay right where you are, madam. She's all right. Well, where do you get your information, the woman asked. From the engine room, madam, he said. But the engine room clearly had told him no such thing. Laureate and the woman now headed back toward the stern, and as they walked, they told other passengers what the captain had said. Second-class passenger Henry Needham may have encountered the pair, for he recalled that the passengers approaching him from a direction of the bridge had shouted, the captain says that the boat will not sink. The remark, Needham wrote, was greeted with cheers. And I noticed that many people who had been endeavoring to get a place in the boats turned away in apparent contentment. Turner's words merely confirmed what the passengers and the crew already believed or wanted to believe, that no torpedo could cause the ship mortal damage. Of the 1,959 passengers aboard the Lusitania, 1,198 perished. In some instances, the stakes are very high life or death high if you don't tell the truth. (laughs) That's what the Apostle Paul is dealing with in the church in Corinth. There are some among them who are distorting the truth and they are veering into the territory of preaching a different gospel. They are giving a false sense of assurance to many and the stakes are at the highest. The apostle has to address the issue and address those teachers directly. And it reminds us of similar occurrences in our day today. And so follow with me as I read 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 to 15. This is what Paul writes to the church and to us. He says, I wish that you would bear with me in a little foolishness. Do bear with me. For I feel a divine jealousy for you since I betrothed you to one husband to to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit than the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. Indeed, I consider that I am not in the least inferior to these super apostles. Even if I am unskilled in speaking, I am not so in knowledge. Indeed, in every way we have made this plain to you in all things. Or did I commit a sin in humbling myself so that you might be exalted 
because I preached God's gospel to you free of charge. I robbed other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve you. And when I was with you and was in need, I did not burden anyone, for the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my need. So I refrained and will refrain from burdening you in any way. As the truth of Christ is in me, this boasting of mine will not be silenced in the regions of Achaia. And why? Because I do not love you? God knows I do. And what I am doing, I will continue to do in order to undermine the claim of those who would like to claim in their boasted mission that they work on the same terms as we do. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, their end will correspond to their deeds. There is a tone (laughs) in this passage. It is the tone of resolve. It is the tone of warning. And at times it is the tone of sarcasm. And Paul identifies three dangers in this church and how his boasting in the cross addresses those dangers. And the first one that we see in verses one to six is that Paul is boasting against the danger of false belief. Verse two, he says, I feel a divine jealousy for you since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. This idea of being betrothed to God is woven throughout the Old Testament and all the way into the New. In the Old Testament, God refers to his people, Israel, in such a fashion that they are betrothed to him to be married. God is the groom and Israel is the bride. Hosea chapter two, verses 19 and 20 says, I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice and steadfast love and in mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness and you shall know the Lord. Similarly, in Isaiah chapter 62, verse five, the prophet writes, for as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you and as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride so shall your God rejoice over you and so the picture is an incredible one of God's love and care and commitment to his people he is the groom his people are the bride and they will be together forever And in the times of the New Testament, this extends to the common practice of fathers and daughters and grooms and brides. Because in the New Testament times, fathers betrothed or promised their daughter to a future husband to be married. And then it was the father's responsibility to ensure the purity of his daughter until that wedding day. And so Paul carries the imagery of the New Testament and into this church that he's now living with. The church is now living in an engagement to the Lord Jesus. Paul, as their spiritual father, has betrothed them to the Lord. And until the wedding day of his return and the marriage supper of the Lamb, the church is to remain pure. And as a result, Paul has jealousy for this purity because the Lord Jesus has jealousy for the purity of his bride. But there's another man in the house. A man who is trying to steal the affections of the betrothed. A man who is making a play and trying to wreck the engagement and to claim her 
as his own. A man who in some ways claims that he is already married to this bride. And the false teachers are the messengers of this man. And so verse three references the fall of Adam and Eve and it points to just how serious the deception is in the church because if Satan is the one who tempted Eve and the Corinthians are found to be in the same place, then they are being tempted toward their demise. They're being led astray. And verse five says it doesn't seem to bother them that this false teaching was among them. They didn't do anything about it. And so just like Eve, they are now in great, great peril because there is another man in the house And he was there intentionally because after all, nobody steals another man's fiance accidentally. That's why Paul says in Romans chapter 16 to identify such things. In verse 17 and on, he says this. He says, I appeal to you brothers to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you've been taught. Avoid them. Now, just let me pause and make an observation. He's not just simply talking about people you don't get along with. (laughs) He's not talking about people who rub you the wrong way. He's saying Christians and church, specifically, watch out for those who create obstacles contrary to doctrine, to what you believe, to the specifics of what you believe. Avoid them. For such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. And by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. For your obedience is known to all, so that I rejoice over you. But I want you to be wise as to what is good and innocent, as to what is evil. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And so... There are teachers among the church and they are delivering a false message. What is the content of that false message? Well, for Paul, the cross of Christ was the central act of human history. The fact that Jesus suffered and died to forgive sins and restores those to new life in him who put their faith in him, also enables and empowers them to suffer in this life temporarily. But they too will receive glory eternally just as the Lord himself did. However, this is not what these teachers promoted. They promoted a different Christ Paul says, and as a result, a different gospel. For them, the cross wasn't the center. It was the afterthought. For them, the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the teaching that if you had the Spirit, then you were delivered from all suffering, even all suffering in this life, right now, that was the ministry or the focal point of their teaching. Now there's a theological word for this. It's called over-realized eschatology. Now before you zone out, just just parse it out with me for a minute. Eschatology is just very simply the study of the end times. The study of God's promises and God's actions toward the end. And it is the dynamic that communicates that when Jesus came, he ushers in the kingdom of God But this kingdom will not be fully consummated or fully realized until he returns again. And so that's why Paul uses the picture of the church as a woman to be betrothed. The wedding hasn't happened yet. There's an already not yet dynamic. The kingdom is already here, but it is not yet here in its fullness. And so growth in faithfulness through suffering results in a glorious wedding day for God's people to their savior upon his return. But the false teachers believed that the wedding had already happened and that if you are indeed belonging to Christ, then you would not suffer difficulty at all in this life. And therefore it's 
overrealized in its scope. It takes promises that God makes to you for eternity, and it takes those promises and applies them to you right now, in this life. This is not just a minor theological nuance. Paul actually says that this is preaching a different Christ and a different gospel. And so verse four, if you look at it with me, he says, if someone comes to you and proclaims another Jesus or you receive a different spirit or you accept a different gospel, that's what the peddlers were pushing. And if the focus on Jesus isn't his work on the cross, and if the focus on the spirit isn't the empowerment of faith and faithfulness to Jesus, then you are receiving a different gospel. And so Paul calls these teachers super apostles. Allegedly, nothing ever goes wrong for them. They have strength and health and wealth because they have the spirit, at least they claim. And anyone who doesn't have those things must not have the spirit, so they claim. And of course, the title, Super Apostle, is dripping with sarcasm. As a person who greatly appreciates sarcasm, I love it when Paul engages in that type of rhetoric. It's oozing with mockery. There's nothing super about these imposters. They are promising something more than Christ. And Christ is enough. So what? <laughs> Some of you at this point might be thinking to yourself, Pastor, that's, that's like moderately interesting. Why does this matter for us right now? Why does the theological um, argument with a, a church 2,000 years ago how does it bear implication onto my life? Well, there are a number of different implications. Uh, let me offer just three very quickly. Paul says in verse one, he asks them to bear with him to engage in a little foolishness. And he's referring not only to the fact that he's boasting in the gospel, and in that, that he is meeting these peddlers on the field of boasting, which seems foolish, but also the content of the gospel itself we know Paul is referred to as foolishness. Here's the implication. You need to know this, that it will look like foolishness to the world. It will look like foolishness to the people around you who don't know God. If you continue to boast in confidence in Christ while you are undergoing great difficulty in life, because for thousands of years, the world has believed that the good life is a life that is free from pain and turmoil. How could you possibly be a child of God if your life is hard, they ask. Must be foolishness, they say. But friends, that's the boast that we make. <laughs> Not that glory is for us right now, but that through Jesus, glory is coming and we will enjoy it soon enough. And so we are faithful to him until the very end of our days. That's implication number one. Implication number two is that, friends, there are many out there today that believe in what we would call an over-realized eschatology, a belief system that promises you more than Christ. It points to a false hope and an expectations for the things in this life that God has promised for eternity and he may or may not give to us in some measure right now. It gives people a false assurance of supernatural healing. It gives people false promises of unique spiritual visions. It lauds the voices of those who claim to see angels. Now, God may grant some of those things in some instances, but this is not the promise that he gives by his spirit to every Christian for all time. And the result is that this type of teaching leaves millions upon millions of people 
with a different Christ, a different spirit, and Paul says a different gospel. And when those promises aren't delivered upon, people become despondent. They're often riddled with guilt because they think that they are the reason why God isn't acting in the way that he's promised. They are the reason. Their guilt, their sin, their difficulty is the reason why God wouldn't bless them or heal them. But friend, in the gospel of Christ, God gives hope to you God blesses you, not based on you being good enough, not based on you finding your own favor with him. He gives you hope and blessing based on what Jesus has done for you and for all of those who have put their faith in him. You can live in joy and in confidence when you believe in a true Jesus, a true spirit that results in a true gospel. And so implication number three is just simply this. It means that our natural desire for immediate gratification and personal autonomy can be suspended. (laughs) And it can be replaced by a reliance on God through the joys and the pains of life. Paul seems to be indicating that standing in Christ means standing against those who intentionally distort Christ. Standing in Christ means standing against something. (laughs) And sometimes it means standing against someone. It means standing against those who distort Christ. And so Paul gives his second reason for boasting. In verses 7 through 12, he is boasting because of a no-charge ministry. He's not charged them for speaking the gospel to them, as he indicates in verse 7 and on. He speaks it free of charge. He's taken support from other churches to do so, he says. You might be surprised to know of some of the incredible speaking fees and that public speakers can get these days. Just a little bit of research will let you know that author Malcolm Gladwell, who's one of the better storytellers of our time, commands $80,000 for an hour of speaking. Former President Bill Clinton gets about $200,000 per speaking engagement. And the former chairman of the Federal Reserve, Ben Bernanke, has received up to $400,000 for an hour of speaking on monetary policy. Former President Donald Trump, over a million dollars per engagement. Why? Well, celebrity, notoriety, the importance of the message, they all point to the value, the monetary value that people will place on the message and thus there's high speaking fees for the speaker. In the first century, people who had celebrity and notoriety and something important to say, charged high speaking fees as well. And in fact, it was common knowledge that the greater the importance of the message, the higher the fee would be. But Paul comes to them with the message of the gospel and his opponents mock him because he charged them nothing, nothing at all. And thus, they claim that his message must be worth nothing. Nothing at all. And so he makes two oaths to them in this boast. He says, verse 10, the boasting of mine will not be silenced in the regions of Achaia, which means in the surrounding verses, he's not gonna start taking money from them despite the fact that they're mocking him for it because it actually points to the motives of his counterparts. He doesn't wanna be confused with them or their message because this gospel of the Lord Jesus is distinct. And secondly, he gives them an oath with regard to his continued love for them. Why? Because I do not love you, he says in verse 11. God knows I do. And his love compels him to speak, to speak even some 
difficult things. In some contexts in the medical community, there is a practice that's widely referred to as mutual pretense. In many cases, mutual pretense is something that takes place after a period of treatment for a particular patient has run its course and it becomes clear to everyone that it's not working and that the patient is going to die. Despite the fact that this dark reality is clearly known by all parties, the doctor, the patient, the family of the patient, they will often deal with the fact by talking about anything other than the reality that the patient is going to die. They'll talk about what will happen once they get out of the hospital or what they're going to do when everyone gets better. They'll talk about sports. They'll talk about family business, anything but the truth of impending death. Mutual pretense is a kind of survival mechanism. It allows everyone to continue talking to each other while not having to actually talk about what's going on, without not having to deal with the brute reality of death. Friends, sadly, there are many Christians today and many churches that practice mutual pretense without even knowing it. They see false notions of the gospel, but they pretend like nothing is wrong. (laughs) And thus, they allow people to live under the idea that everything is okay. And everyone is okay. There's no torpedo that could sink this ship when all the while, they're dying. Paul is a spiritual surgeon. He's the surgeon who does no such thing, and he does it because he loves them. He, sometimes this love is expressed in delivering them good news. Sometimes this love is expressed in delivering bad news. It doesn't allow people to believe what isn't true, and it, as a result, he saves them from dying because the stakes of the gospel are that high. Now, some people hear that, and I want to pause here just for a minute and back out. Some people hear that and say, well, here comes the truth police. <laughs> and we've all probably met people along the way that, that view themselves as the truth police or the purity police. And anybody who doesn't align accordingly, they're just mean and nasty and a jerk. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about clarity. Clarity when the stakes are the absolute highest. And Paul delivers that kind of clarity to them. Love through truth, and he boasts in this truth and in this love. And so standing in Christ means that sometimes we stand against those who intentionally distort Christ. And that brings Paul to his third reason for boasting. He's boasting as an apostle because in his midst are false apostles. Falsity that is presented as truth is really dangerous, especially if it is something you stake your life on. It's even more so when you stake your eternity on it. A teacher who conveys such a thing is another kind of danger. And Paul takes everything that he's been giving them in this warning and he brings it all to a very pointed accusation and to a head. It's the most direct condemnation that he can give. Look at verses 13 and 15. He says this. He says, For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as the apostle of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. False apostles are not Christians. (laughs) They're disguising themselves as such in order to deceive They're not merely ignorant, nor are they just slightly off in their theology. When they distort the gospel itself, the consequences are of the most serious kind. And make no mistake about it, 
In verse three, he alludes to them being deceivers like the serpent. And here he makes the accusation explicit. Friends, there are people, you need to know this, there are people who throughout the ages have disguised themselves to deceive those who are genuinely seeking the Lord. And they do it for their own gain. And Paul says in the sharpest of words, they do it as agents of Satan. And so he grounds the claim in verse 14. Satan disguises himself as an agent of, angel of light. In verse 15, he makes the implication. So it's no surprise that his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. And so how do you know? How do you know if the teaching you get <laughs> is true or false? If it leads to life and eternity and salvation or if it leads to damnation and to hell. How do you know? The answer is to rely on what the Bible says. (laughs) Because most people who engage in an over-realized eschatology who promise more than Christ, they promise more than the Bible says. The richness of God's word and the certainty and the sufficiency of it is for your good. And what does the Bible say about the core of the gospel of Jesus Christ? It says that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. It says that through his perfect life, he was worthy to be the ultimate sacrifice for sin, a penalty which he paid on the cross, that all who would believe in him would be forgiven and they would receive a new life in his name right now and an eternal life with God forever. And so as a result, we live by faith through knowing that Jesus has secured our future and that the Spirit of God guides us in the present through the joys and the sorrows, through the successes and the failures, through health and through suffering until Jesus returns or we die and we get to enjoy eternity with him forever. That's the gospel. That's Christ. You can have that hope, you can have that joy, you can have that peace, you can have that security. All you need, Jesus says, is to repent from your sins and to receive the free forgiveness that he offers. And each one of us is called to a decision point along those very lines. You don't put your faith in Jesus just to make your life better. (laughs) You don't put your faith in Jesus because you think there'll be no more suffering the day that you do. That's not the gospel, Paul says. The gospel is that you have a mortal and immortal need for the forgiveness of sin, to be with God forever, and Jesus provides that exact opportunity. But watch out. There will be no shortage of deceitful workmen who will try to give you another gospel. Let me conclude with two stories to illustrate the point. For more than 40 years, a lighthouse stood on a large peninsula jutting out into the Tasman Sea in southern Australia. It stood at a place where it shouldn't have, and it was luring ignorant ships into the very rocks that they were trying to avoid. The cliffs around Cape St. George, just south of Jervis Bay, were notorious for shipwrecks, so it was decided that a lighthouse was needed for the safe navigation of coastal shipping. In 1857, the the colonial architect, Alexander Dawson, began looking for a site suitable for a lighthouse on Cape St. George, but unfortunately, Dawson was more interested in the ease of construction rather than providing an efficient navigation aid. 
And so when the pilot's board went to verify the location Dawson chose, they found that the site was not visible from the required approaches. They also found Dawson's map suffered from discrepancies so grave that it was impossible to decide whether positions marked on the map really existed. The board also suspected that Dawson chose the site solely because it was situated closer to a quarry that he planned to obtain the stones from. But despite the glaring deficiencies and disagreement by the majority of the board, for reasons not known, the chairman of the board authorized the construction of the lighthouse anyway. And for the next four decades, 40 years, the ill-sighted lighthouse was responsible for some two dozen shipwrecks. Eventually, in 1899, the lighthouse was replaced by the Point Perpendicular Lighthouse in a much more suitable location on this part of the coast. But even after the decommissioning, the lighthouse continued to cause navigational problems, especially when moonlit nights, when the golden sandstone tower glowed in the dark. So, the, so near the turn of the century, the tower was reduced to rubble to prevent any further disaster. What a picture of people who stand to speak for God, but offer you a different Christ, <laughs> a different spirit, and as a result, a different gospel. Standing in Christ means that we stand against those who intentionally distort him. Why? Because eternal life and death are the things that are at stake. It is that serious. But friends, when you know Christ, when you really know him and trust him and begin to enjoy him, there is no greater value. In the late 1800s, Charles Berry, an English preacher, became the pastor of Great Plymouth Church in Brooklyn. And one day, Barry described how earlier in his years he had come to faith in Jesus Christ. There had been a time in Barry's early ministry when he preached a very thin gospel, really no gospel at all. As did the Corinthians, he looked upon Jesus as merely a noble teacher, but not as a divine redeemer. And late one night during his first pastorate, as he sat in a cozy study, there came a knock on the door. And he opened the door, and he found a typical Lancashire girl with a shawl cover over her head and clogs on her feet. Are you the minister, she asked. And he asked, getting the affirmative answer, she went on breathlessly, you must come with me very quickly. I want to get my mother in thinking that this was a case of another drunken mother out in the streets, Barry said, well, you must go and get a policeman. No, 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 the girl said. My mother is dying and you must come and get her into heaven. Barry got dressed. He followed her for a mile and a half through the lonely streets in the middle of the night. He knelt at the woman's side and he began telling her how good and kind Jesus was and how he'd come to show us how to live. And then the desperate woman cut him off and said, Mister, there's no use in that for the likes of me. I'm a sinner. I've lived my life. It's over. Can't you tell me of someone who can have mercy upon me and save my poor soul? I stood there in the presence of the dying woman, Barry said. And I realized I had nothing to tell her. In the midst of sin and death, I had no message. In order to bring something to that dying woman, I leapt back to my mother's knee, to my cradle faith, and I began to tell her the story of the cross and of a Christ who is able to save to the uttermost. And as the tears began to run down the woman's cheeks, now you're getting it, she said. Now you're helping me. And Barry concludes the story by saying, through the words, 
I got her in. (laughs) And blessed be to God, I got myself in as well. Now of course he doesn't mean that he obtained heaven for himself. He means that knowing the true gospel to save sinners and to appropriate your trust to the Lord Jesus is the greatest hope, the greatest joy, and the greatest confidence in this life. It is for him, it is for me, and it can be for you. And so I commend this Christ in the face of all of the false Christs that are presented, I commend this Christ to you. Let's pray. Father, in the quietness of our hearts and in the recognition that there are so many spiritual ideas out there, perhaps today you are even working to save some that they would know this Christ. Today, may you deliver salvation. God, perhaps today you are working in some of us, in some of us who have believed in false promises, promises more than Christ. Today, God, show us the glory of your Son again. God, perhaps for some of us, we see the need to bolster our confidence in him and him alone and stand for this true Christ, the true spirit, and the true gospel. Give us faith and courage to do just that in a world that so readily confuses these messages. We thank you for clarity of truth in the midst of love for the sake of salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.